On the 15th of December, 2022, the tranquility of Somerset Pond was shattered by a horrific incident. The Independence Police received a 911 call that Thursday from the concerned co-workers of 32-year-old Amberly Harris. The reason for my call is we have an employee that has not reported to work in almost a week do have reason to be concerned. The officers conducted a welfare check at Amberly's apartment, but they were met with a gruesome crime scene. Is Amberly here? Amberly? She passed away. Amberly's disfigured corpse was found lying in her bedroom. She'd been shot point blank in the face with a shotgun. The major question on the detectives' minds wasn't who murdered Amberly, as the killer was the very same person who answered the door. So the two questions they asked themselves were, why did he kill Amberly? What were the events that led to her gruesome murder? Independence, a city about 15 minutes south of Cincinnati, Ohio, in Kenton County, is known for its tight-knit, supportive community of over 28,000 residents. The residents are warm and friendly, offering hospitality to both newcomers and long-term inhabitants. Safety is a top priority in Independence, with low crime rates and a strong law enforcement presence, providing a secure environment for everyone. Many find it an ideal place to call home, free from the constant worry of crime. This welcoming and safe community has attracted new residents over the years, and among those new residents was 32-year-old Amberly Harris, a woman who had chosen independence as her new home due to the promised safety and security. Amberly Nicole Harris was born on the 7th of September, 1990, to parents Tammy and Daryl Harris. She grew up in Rowan County, North Carolina, with four other siblings, Jessica, Alyssa, Wesley, and Brandon. Amberly was often described as a free-spirited, kind-hearted, and loving young woman by the people around her. She always knew how to light up a room and put smiles on people's faces. Her kind and caring nature made people gravitate towards her, and she was loved by her family and colleagues. She was also the mother of three beautiful children. She gave birth to her two boys, Jojo and Hunter, while she courted a man named Jones, and she had her daughter, Michaela, during her relationship with a man named Strand. Amberly was an amazing mother who loved spending time with her family. She enjoyed going to the beach with her children whenever she had the chance, and she was also an avid lover of animals, as she kept many pets. The people close to her often said Amberly was always seen with a smile on her face, but her life wasn't perfect. Sometime during her late 20s, Amberly struggled with substance abuse. She'd been through a lot of adversity during those years, and it was a very hard period in her life. However, Amberly wasn't going to let the hard times keep her down. In an effort to improve her life and for the sake of her children, Amberly fought against the growing addiction. It was a long and tumultuous journey, but in the end, Amberly emerged victorious. It wasn't easy, but she was able to overcome the addiction and come out stronger. The changes didn't stop there. Amberly, who was 30 at the time, decided to move from Mooresville, North Carolina to Independence City, Northern Kentucky. It was a significant move, as Independence was seven hours away from her hometown and she had no family or friends there. However, Amberly had secured a job at Bluegrass Quality Meats, a food production company close to the city. She was given a position in production and quality assurance and couldn't wait to start. Besides the job, there was another reason why Amberly decided to move to Independence, and that reason was a man named Tommy Joe Powell. This video is brought to you by Bespoke Post. Meet Bespoke Post, the monthly membership club that delights you with a box of awesome brilliance brimming with high-end products from under-the-radar brands. What sets this apart? A staggering 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based in the U.S. By subscribing, you're not only treating yourself to premium items, but you're also supporting the cause of small brands deserving recognition for their outstanding work. But that's not all. Bespoke Post customizes each box of awesome to your personal preferences through a quick quiz. Let's take a closer look at one of their offerings. The Weekender Box, a fan favorite, is designed for those impromptu getaways. Within, you'll discover a collection of top-tier products to make your weekend memorable. And should you prefer, you can opt for the Tinsel Box, perfect for brightening your home during this holiday season. And there's no shortage of options. You can also select from their ever-evolving lineup of amazing boxes, each unveiling a treasure trove of new products you never knew you needed. Ready to get started? 
explore their website to see all the exciting boxes available. And here's an exclusive offer only for our subscribers. Get an exciting 20% discount on your first box of awesome by simply clicking the link in the description and applying promo code MYSTERIO20 at checkout or visit bespokepost.com slash MYSTERIO20. Don't miss the opportunity to uncover premium goods at an incredibly affordable price. Join Bespoke Post today and claim your very own box of awesome. Amberly had started a relationship with Tommy and the couple lived together in apartment 4653 in the Somerset Pond apartment complex on Beach Grove Drive. Amberly loved and cared for Tommy, but they had a very abusive relationship, and it wasn't always smooth sailing for the couple. Tommy was Amberly's on and off boyfriend for the two years she lived in Independence. During their time together, some of the couple's neighbors described Tommy as a funny, helpful, and outgoing guy, while others described him as a very odd, quiet, and reserved man. The neighbors all had different opinions on Tommy and his character, but the only person who really knew him was Amberly. During the early months of their relationship, the couple would usually get into fights. Amberly often told herself that no couple was perfect, so she was willing to overlook the frequent squabbles at first. However, it wasn't long before Tommy started getting physical. In the later months of their relationship, most of the couple's arguments ended in physical fights. These fights were often instigated by Tommy, but as the disagreements grew, so did Tommy's anger. Many neighbors could hear the couple screaming at each other late at night, and Amberly's love for Tommy soon turned to fear. While she was at work, Amberly would tell her co-workers that she was scared to go home, and most of them would offer her an extra bedroom and tell her to stay with them. However, Amberly knew she couldn't stay with her co-workers forever, and she always went home eventually. As time went on, Amberly sent her mother videos of the abuse she was suffering. Amberly had been documenting Tommy's abuse in case she ever needed it, and her family back in North Carolina constantly urged her to leave Tommy and go to a woman's shelter, but Amberly never did. She told her family that it wasn't because she didn't want to. It was because she was scared he would follow her. Things reached a breaking point on the 20th of November, 2021. Tommy was infuriated with Amberly's use of social media, and he picked a fight with her. The argument got so heated at one point that Tommy struck Amberly in the face and started choking her to the point where she almost blacked out. Amberly managed to escape his grip and ran barefoot to the Independence Police Department. The records show Amberly had severe abrasions and bruises on her face, neck, and chest. The complaint was filed on the 20th of November, 2021, and Tommy was convicted of domestic violence assault in April, 2022. Tommy was charged with first-degree strangulation, an offense punishable by 5 to 10 years. But when it was time for Amberly to cooperate with prosecutors and testify against Tommy, she didn't, as she was scared of what he would do when he got out. Since Amberly didn't come forward as a witness, which would have allowed prosecutors to charge Tommy with a felony for strangulation, the charge was reduced to fourth-degree domestic violence assault. Tommy was allowed to plead guilty to an assault charge instead of facing the full felony charge, which would have resulted in imprisonment. The incident was treated as a misdemeanor, and Tommy was sentenced to conditional discharge. The court ordered him to undergo anger management, domestic violence treatment, and batterer intervention classes, but he was non-compliant with the treatment program, attending none of them. Even after everything that had happened with the domestic violence incident, Amberly still cared about Tommy. A part of her believed he could change and get better. He was also on probation, so she knew he wouldn't do anything that would land him in trouble while they still lived together. The couple continued living together for an additional seven months after the initial incident, and while they still had occasional fights, they never escalated to anything serious. It wasn't long before December arrived, and Amberly, who loved the Christmas holiday, put up a Christmas tree in their apartment. She then called her family on the 10th of December, 2022, telling them she was making plans to come home to North Carolina for Christmas, intending to surprise her mother, Tammy. She worked out her plans with her sister, Jessica, and her brother-in-law, Michael. Once everything was finalized, she reminded them to keep her trip back home a secret from Tammy before bidding her goodbyes. Amberly couldn't wait to surprise her mom on Christmas and looked forward to reuniting with her children and the entire family on the 25th. 
The date was the 15th of December, 2022. It was around 9 a.m. on that Thursday, and the employees of Bluegrass Quality Meats, located at 2648 Crescent Springs Pike, near Langer, Kentucky, were worried sick about their co-worker, Amberly Harris. Amberly hadn't come to work for the past several days, which was very unusual. She'd worked in production and quality assurance for the past two years, and during that period, Amberly was never late, and she always made sure to call in case there was an issue. Both Amberly's co-workers and her employer knew something was wrong, but they waited to see if she would come in later during the day. As the hours passed by and Amberly still hadn't arrived, they finally decided to call the Independence Police Department around 2 in the afternoon, asking for a welfare check at her apartment. The reason for my call is we have an employee that has not reported to work in almost a week do have reason to be concerned. The call was received by Independence Police Captain Brian Ferriorni, and a few minutes later, a few Independence officers, led by Captain Ferriorni and Independence Detective Adam Strine, made their way to the apartment in the 4600 block of Beach Grove Drive for a well-being check at the request of Amberley's employer. The authorities arrived around 2.57 p.m., and after knocking on the door, they were greeted by a man who made a disturbing statement that shocked them all. Amberly? She passed away. What? You did what? What? Where is she? Where is she? Put your hand on her. Where is she? Watching something. She's in the back. What? Tommy's immediate confession stunned the independence officers. They'd come all this way for a welfare check, but it had turned into a murder investigation in a matter of seconds. Tommy was immediately handcuffed, and the officers rushed into the apartment to find Amberly. Where is she? Watch, watching something, Brady. In the back. What? Oh, independence, please make yourself known! In the piss, please make yourself known! In the piss, please, please, Jenner, make yourself known! Go! Watch your footing, watch your footing. We're in here, run. Huh? Clear. In the piss, please, Jenner, make yourself known! Make yourself known! Go. Come on, let me clear. Oh, she's down. What? I got her, she's down. The officers found Amberly's body in the master bedroom. She was lying in a small space between the bed and the wall. It appeared she'd been shot in the head at close range. The officers immediately called for backup before securing the crime scene. Make sure you're watching where you're standing and don't touch anything. Yes, sir. When? When did you do this? While the crime scene was being secured, Tommy was searched by the remaining officer and asked to identify himself. Our victim here, so we're trying to figure out further. Or What's your name? Check, Tommy. Over the door, Tommy? The okay. Just in your car. Yeah, we'll work that out in a second, but I gotta make sure my guys inside are okay. Alright. Rongi, you guys good? Yeah, we're good. Alright. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. Okay. As his Miranda rights were read to him by the officer outside, the officers in the house already had a disturbing suspicion. They could tell from the state of Amberly's corpse that her murder wasn't recent. So to clear their doubts, they asked Tommy when he had shot her. The ghastly crime scene was already a disturbing sight. But what horrified the detectives even more were the words that came out of Tommy's mouth when he answered their question. Tommy, I'm going to read you something real quick, okay? Miranda Wright. Yeah. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you in court. You have the right to an attorney before making a statement and have your attorney with you during questioning. You cannot afford an attorney to desire one the court appoint one for you. You may stop questioning any time but refuse to answer further or requesting a soul with your attorney. Do you understand these rights, Tommy? All right. Is there anyone else inside? Is it just her? Oh well, my pups. Okay, is it just Amberly? All right. Is it contained in there? When? When did, you do when did all this just happen? Sunday night. Monday morning. Sunday. Monday morning. Monday morning. 
Those were the words that came from Tommy's mouth. Amberly was shot approximately three days earlier. And what Tommy's answer really meant was that after he'd shot Amberly, he'd left her body to rot in the same house where he slept, ate, and carried out his daily activities for the past three days. The authorities couldn't believe their ears when they heard Tommy had been living with Amberly's rotting corpse for the last three days without calling 911 or informing anyone. They'd already found a gun in plain sight in Tommy's home, and they assumed this firearm was the murder weapon. There's a gun in one of the rooms down. No, the gun's out of the bed. On the bed. Right. Clear and air, I guess. Contact. Contact. Uh, one, two, and three. Two, three. Two, three. Also, fire on the ground. Yeah. As two officers went back inside the house to locate the murder weapon, Tommy was escorted to the police car, where he was asked to paint a clearer picture of what happened that morning. We're gonna go in the back of the other side. Other side, my man. A little too tight. A little too tight. Hold on a second. Just take a seat, I'm gonna leave this door cracked. You good? Do you need a squad or anything to check you out? Alright, do you wanna tell me what happened here? I was fighting, he's trash my shit again. Okay. Do you want to tell me what happened here? When were you guys fighting? Sunday morning. Sunday morning? What started the fight? I was my shit. Throwing what was it? I'm so, what was it? She was throwing my TV and stuff. Okay. And then what happened? I lost control. You what now? I lost control. Lost control? What made you lose control? Are you okay? No. So when you say you lost control, what do you mean? Sure. What'd you shoot her with? Hey, it's 19 yards, 10 to 30. 20 gauge. 20 gauge? Go ahead. Alright, so it was a shotgun you shot her with? Hey, I gotta get my body camera. Do you guys need anything from the office at this point? I don't believe so. Alright, Tommy, you okay right now? 7 to 30. I'm gonna keep my eyes on you, but I'm gonna roll down this one. The officer who took him could tell Tommy seemed out of it. His answers were incoherent, and he tried asking Tommy some questions to see if he was in his right mind. How long have you been inside the house for? Where? Three or four days. Have you left the house or anything? Three to seven. There's no one else at the office. You've been in shock since? Yeah. Okay. You don't know what today is, though? Yeah, one thirty-two, seven three. Do you know Hi. what month it is? Who's the president? It was evident that Tommy was still in shock after the murder, but he was able to confirm that he'd been living with Amberly's body for the past three to four days. The officers were still going to carry out an autopsy on Amber's body later down the line to give them a more definitive answer but it seemed Tommy still wasn't sure if it was Sunday or Monday morning. A few minutes after Tommy was taken to the police car, the officers' reinforcements had arrived. With additional officers and detectives on the scene, they decided to carry out another search of the couple's apartment. However, due to procedure, they needed verbal consent from Tommy to carry out an official search of the entire house. Mirandize him. He's been Miranda. Mirandize him, see if he'll give you consent to search on the body cam and if he gives you consent we can pro you can process um, and then I don't know I, I mean by that whoever point, if, I don't know if they're going to have Strine or whoever to come take him back you right. want, they'll want you well they'll probably want to take him back and interview him Tommy do we have consent to search your whole house Tommy was then taken to the Independence Police Station by an officer while the remaining officers stayed behind to search the house said he shot How her long? Monday 
Uh, her face is covered. She's down in between the bed and the wall. Okay, just give us, if it's obvious right now and there's no, we don't need any further care. And so, and so we can, uh, yeah, I just gotta put her on the monitor first before okay. I say yes. All right, so we got rigor as well being checked. We aren't rigor, but we're not moving anything until we get more people. As more officials arrive, those first on the scene. After another search of the house, the officers decided to wait for additional help from the forensic department before moving anything. We're gonna wait on that. We're gonna wait on that until more people get here. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. I got his first. Yeah. I'm gonna put. I got put on four lead to verify completely. I want to. Do you have a time frame of all this? One day between the bed and the. That's what we heard. He shot her Monday. He said. Well, I I didn't see what this initial call was. A well-being check. Somebody else called about it. Yes. Okay. And yeah. There's blood splatter on the wall, and she's covered up. Her face is covered up. Yeah, he covered her. her well, so it was something's covered. Do the well-being check, that dude. He was here at the house. Like we opened the. He opened the door and said. While the first responders briefed the new officers who had just arrived at the crime scene, the forensics department, along with the additional help they were waiting for, had also arrived. With everyone now at the scene, they were able to continue the search. Chief, are you in here? Yeah. I'm coming through with the camera on to do a uh, walk for uh, There's a TV on the floor in the bedroom where this occurred. That's just, it looks like it may have been on a... Like a, a shell purse, purse. may have been knocked off. But other than that, no. It doesn't look like it's like destroyed. It just looks like it's been knocked off. The door does look like it's been kicked off the hinges. Yeah, make sure you move this around right here. And get whatever these are, because it looks like these pills might be everywhere. Uh, so they, you know, if you want to call Melissa, just to help out once you start getting into this stuff. Tommy arrived at the Independence Police Station at exactly 3.31 p.m. and was taken in for questioning while the search was still being carried out at the crime scene. I'm Detective Stride uh, with the Independence Police. This is Detective Young, McDowell's Mirror. Okay. I don't know anything, man. I was at home, just kind of hanging out. Um, apparently, we got a call to your home. You looked up. What's going on? You shot your girlfriend? Okay. So, real quick, who who lives there? Who Whose name's on the lease? Mine. Your name's on the lease? Okay. okay. So, real quick, man, um, do you mind if we search your residence? The interrogation began with Detective Strine asking Tommy to give written consent to allow them to continue searching his home. Tommy was then asked further questions by the detectives, but a few minutes into answering them, he became sick and threw up. Stomach bug, Tommy, or do you uh, got the flu? What's going on, buddy? Talk to me. COVID. COVID? Okay. Oh, so you haven't been to the doctor? Tommy wasn't sure why he suddenly got sick, so he made a guess. However, the detectives were unfazed and tried to push forward with the interrogation and the signing of the written search consent document. Walk me through the process of how this kind of went through. Um, and before we kind of begin with that, um, we have officers that are at your house right now, okay? Uh, obviously, we need to be able to kind of process that scene effectively, and what will make that scene processing a little bit easier is if you take one of this consent to search form and allow us access to search your own. Is that okay? okay? So I'm gonna walk this through with you real quick, okay? So how it works is that you're gonna sign your name. Despite their best efforts, Tommy was unable to continue with the interrogation, and paramedics were eventually called to the scene to check on him. Where you are right now? Independence what? Sure. Okay. Do you want to go to the hospital so they can see what's going on with you? Please. After running some tests, the paramedics concluded that Tommy needed to go to the hospital. The detectives didn't let him leave that easily as there were a few things they needed to clarify regarding Tommy's activities and his timeline after the murder. They also needed to take some images of him before he left the station. Have you tried to communicate with anybody since Sunday, by any chance? No? Not like, like family members, any other friends, her friends perhaps? You haven't tried to talk to them at all? Okay. Like stand up, I'm gonna take some pictures of you real quick against this wall. 
real quick. We're going to try to be as quick as we can, okay? Do me a favor. Stand up. Stand straight up this way. Kind of look at me. Please don't kick that over. Goodness. I have a mess, and these ladies would kill me. Stand up against that wall for me. Once his pictures were taken, Tommy was escorted to the hospital. They left the station around 5.05 p.m., and it was a 26-minute drive before they arrived at the hospital. We'll get you inside here, Tommy. Check your temperature. Thank you. <laughs> if I get that, you can hold off. Shave it. My cheek went out. Hey, buddy, I'm Dr. Patel. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened to bring you here? Or do you want them to step out a little bit? We can't yeah. leave. He's in our custody. Okay. 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 He's been pretty forth. He's told us everything that we need to know and everything's going on with him. He's okay. been a good man. Yeah. And so what brings you here, though? After more comprehensive tests, the doctors diagnosed Tommy with dehydration. So he had to be hospitalized for a while before being sent to the Kenton County Detention Center. With Tommy under supervised watch in the hospital, most of the officers returned to the Somerset Pond neighborhood to carry out a more thorough investigation in the hope of understanding why Tommy suddenly killed Amberly, as they weren't buying the story he told them about losing it. Additionally, they wanted the investigation to shed more light on the events that transpired before Amberly's gruesome murder. The independence detectives decided to start their investigation with Tommy and Amberly's neighbors. After being questioned by the police, the couple's neighbors were interviewed by the press who had heard about the murder and were also on the scene. The first neighbor to be interviewed was a man named Mike Rottenberger, a maintenance manager who lived and worked in the apartment complex. Mike knew Tommy pretty well as they'd worked together on certain jobs where Tommy offered to help. Due to their close relationship, the press asked for Mike's thoughts on the entire incident. I mean, he was always a great guy. I mean, just funny, outgoing, likes to talk. Lonely, decent guy. When you heard he's been arrested. I, it threw me for a loop. Room with this body for more than a day. That sounds a little unusual. That creeps me out a little bit. Now I'm starting to doubt some of the things that I know about some people out here. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it, all quiet, but, you know, I trust in people like I trusted him and now finding this out, it's... After Mike Rottenberger, the next neighbor the press spoke to was a woman named Elisa Durham. I actually know them, but I know that we heard like banging over the past like weekend over there. But other than that, we didn't even know that it had happened. And our walls are pretty thin, so if it was if it was like loud arguing, we would have heard it. But we didn't hear any arguing. But there was like loud noises, like I said. Well, she didn't know the couple. She'd apparently heard some strange noises coming from the couple's home that night. Elisa had already given her statements to the detectives, and she later repeated those statements to the press. The detectives spoke to two additional neighbors that night, Dustin Maines and Tammy Borchardt. These two lived much closer to the couple, and they'd heard them fight on numerous occasions. Ms. Borchardt went on to provide additional details while giving her statements to the detectives mentioning some strange phrases Tommy had made while they were having a conversation. Tommy had told Ms. Borchardt that he had done a bad thing and he might get in trouble for it. At the end of their odd conversation, Tommy also said he didn't know what to do about it. And Ms. Borchardt told the detectives he never mentioned what the thing he had done was. Both Mr. Maines and Ms. Borchardt provided summarized versions of their statements to the press the next morning. They did fight, and uh, and uh, I didn't even know she was back, to be honest with you. And then you'll find the clothes piled up outside the door and everything, and they can be loud and things. After talking to Mr. Maines and Ms. Borchardt, the press went around the neighborhood that same morning, talking to the neighbors the detectives had already interviewed. Two, three o'clock in the morning, you'd hear them stomping around or hitting that wall, and. So it was almost a nightly ritual. They spoke to Leanna Rottenberger, the property manager's daughter. Leanna's apartment was directly across from the couple's, and she was shocked to hear the news, as there'd never been a murder in their neighborhood before. I mean, we've had people pass away from old age and overdoses, but we've never had like a murder happen around here, so it's really surprising. 
One of the last people the detectives and the press interviewed was a woman who didn't know Tommy, but had seen him around helping in the neighborhood. He absolutely seemed like a great guy. I've seen him help the maintenance man a couple times. I mean, very helpful person. Never could imagine what he did. The Independence detectives made sure to talk to every resident in the Somerset Pond neighborhood after the autopsy results revealed that Amber Lee was actually murdered on the previous Sunday evening. While their statements confirmed the couple often quarreled, there was nothing that explained why Tommy chose to kill her that Sunday evening. The detectives asked themselves what made that morning different as they struggled to figure out why Tommy went as far as shooting Amberly in the face with a 20-gauge shotgun. That's when they received a call from Eagle Financial Services, a financial services agency that operates several locations in northern Kentucky. They told the detectives that an accidental death and dismemberment insurance policy worth $20,000 was taken out in Amberly Harris's name in November. Unsurprisingly, the only beneficiary listed on the policy was Tommy Joe Powell. The statements from Eagle Financial Services, in addition to the insurance policy document they provided, served as both a motive and incriminating evidence against Tommy. The detectives managed to piece together the events leading up to Amberly's death. They believed that after Tommy had taken out the insurance policy against Amberly, he looked for a way to pick a fight that Sunday evening, as he always did. Tommy had been drinking on the day of the murder and had picked a fight with Amberly, telling her not to touch the TV while the pair were in their bedroom. This led to a heated argument because Tommy knew how to infuriate Amberly. A couple of minutes into the argument, he shot her in the face. He'd planned it all out on how he'd take the insurance money and flee. But what Tommy didn't expect was the shock he'd experience after killing Amberly. Even when he got over it, he didn't know how to proceed from there, as he had no idea what to do with her body or how to claim the insurance money without a feasible explanation. This led him to wander aimlessly for days in the same house with Amberly's body before the Independence police knocked on the door. After piecing the events of the night together, the detectives carried out a final investigation into Tommy Joe Powell. Tommy Joe Powell was born on the 1st of September, 1968. He served in the Navy during his early 20s. And after his years in service, Tommy suffered from mental health issues and addiction. He also had a prolific criminal record with charges ranging from drug possession to drug paraphernalia and two domestic violence charges, the latter of which was filed by Amberly. The detectives didn't need to look too deep into Tommy as they already knew what the outcome of the trial would be. Tommy Joe Powell was arrested on the 15th of December 2022 after the complications he had with dehydration had been solved. He was booked into the Kenton County Detention Center and subsequently charged with murder domestic violence, a capital offense in Kentucky that carries a possible punishment of 20 to 50 years or life in prison if convicted. Tommy was held on a $1 million bond while he awaited trial. Due to Tommy's immediate confession, the trial was very simple. Kenton County Commonwealth Attorney Rob Sanders and Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney Taylor Roof were the prosecutors on the case. Attorney Roof made a statement during the trial saying, Tommy Joe Powell is a stereotypical example of why domestic violence is a deadly epidemic. His crimes escalated from assault to strangulation and then murder. Tommy, who wasn't fighting for his innocence, asked the presiding judge, Patricia Sum, for leniency through his attorney, begging her to consider his service in the Navy and his history of mental health issues and addiction. Tommy also penned an apology to the Harris family for killing Amberly. The letter was given to Tommy's attorney during the trial, and she read it aloud, saying, I wanted all of you to know how deeply sore I am from the bottom of my heart and soul for what happened that night. My actions caused a very special lady to be taken from us. Amberly's sister and the entire family were present during the trial, and they rejected Tommy's apology. Jessica had told the press that the family couldn't even see Amberly because of the damage Tommy did to her, and her pain only increased when she thought of Amberly's three children who were staying with their fathers in North Carolina. Both the prosecutors and the Harris family urged the judge for a life sentence, citing the disturbing crime scene photos and the life insurance policy Tommy bought. The trial came to a close on the 18th of September 2023 in Kenton County Circuit Court, 
and Tommy Joe Powell was sentenced to life imprisonment. Despite the life sentence being handed down, Amberly's sister Jessica said nothing's really changed for her. She made an emotional statement to the press after the trial, saying, He gets to be there. He gets to breathe. He gets to be alive. He gets to eat. He gets to sleep. He gets to... I have an urn of ashes at my house with my sister. Attorney Sanders still hopes the sentence will eventually bring closure to the Harris family and send a message to future abusers. He gave a statement to the press saying, he'll be approaching 80 years old before he's even eligible for parole and will be there to oppose his parole, whether it's me or someone else who takes my place 20 years down the road. Assistant Attorney Roof echoed similar statements in a press release saying, Tommy Powell shot Amberly in the head with a shotgun at close range, killing her in a scene so gruesome it looked like something out of a horror movie. Changes in our own policies. I don't know that any of those changes necessarily would have saved Ms. Harris's life, but I know that uh, I'm not going to take a chance on anything like this happening again. The life sentence was the closest thing to justice for Harris's family, who drove from several states away to attend the final sentencing. Let this be a warning to perpetrators of domestic violence everywhere. If you kill your victim, you'll go to prison forever, just like Tommy Joe Powell. Amberly's tragic case inspired change in the Kenton County Department. Most of the officers who'd worked on the case felt Amberly might still be alive today if they'd put a little more effort into convincing her to testify against Tommy when she filed the initial domestic violence charge. The department then promised officers would make an effort to see victims in person instead of calling them. Attorney Sanders spoke to the press on the matter, saying, I'm not sure those changes in policies would have saved Ms. Harris's life, but I know I'm not going to take a chance on anything like this happening again. Two monuments were built outside the couple's apartment in memory of Amberly, and the messages read, May you find comfort in the arms of an angel, and it's all part of the master's plan, a step on the road to home. A celebration of life was held for Amberly Harris on the 23rd of December, 2022, at the chapel of Caven Cook Funeral Home in North Carolina. She leaves behind her mother and stepfather, Tammy and Gerald Horn, her grandmother, Elizabeth Harris, her brother, Brandon Harris, her sisters, Jessica Mann and Alyssa Harris, her three children, Jojo, Hunter and Michaela, as well as many aunts, uncles, nieces and cousins. She was very loved by all. The case of Amberly Harris is a very tragic one. It sheds light on domestic violence issues, and one can only hope the changes it brought managed to help people in similar situations. We'd also like to know your thoughts on the case. Do you think the life sentence was enough to bring justice to the Harris family in the end? Or do you think Tommy was sincere in his apology? We'd love to know your opinion. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like us to cover a case, please drop your recommendation in the comment section. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more gripping true stories like this.